Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we are on episode two. What I call it an episode? We are on day two of Mystery Week and today I'm just gonna get straight into it. We are gonna be talking about the Weepy Voiced Killer, which is kind of a ridiculous name to be honest. Between 1980 and 1982, the Weepy Voiced Killer carried out a series of attacks on women in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. And after every single attack he would commit, he would then call 911, he would tell them what he did, he would tell them where to find the body, and he would talk about how remorseful he is, and he wishes he didn't do it, but he can't help himself, and he would do it in this really horrible, weepy voice, hence the name Weepy Voice Killer. On December 31st in 1980, the Weepy Voice Killer would carry out his first attack. Karen Potak was a university student at the Stevens Point University, and her and her sisters were kind of out um, partying to bring in the new year. They were at a club or a bar or something on University Avenue in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. And if you don't know what the Twin Cities area is, I honestly do not understand it at all why it's called the Twin Cities area. But what I do know is that on one side of University Avenue is St. Paul's, which is the capital of Minnesota. And on the other side of University Avenue is Minneapolis, which is the biggest city in Minnesota. And they're just kind of grouped together as the Twin Cities for some reason, and I have no idea what that reason is. Anyway, at some point between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m., Karen stumbled out onto University Avenue, which is where the club or bar that she was at was on, that was the road that it was on. She was very drunk, she was still drinking a glass of champagne and she must have been freezing because the temperatures were literally below freezing and she was not wearing a jacket. So she was trying to, she was like stumbling around trying to get somewhere. Her friends didn't notice that she was gone from the club until 1 a.m. So they didn't know that she left, they didn't know where she was going. It was assumed, assumed everyone gets mad because I say assumed um, but you're just gonna have to get used to it okay it's assumed that she was trying to get home or something um, but she stumbled in to like an alleyway which was deserted it was only her and then a man in a car so the man drove up to Karen he had heating in his car by the way and he noticed that she wasn't wearing a jumper and he offered for her to get into the car warm up and he will drive her wherever she needs to go and Karen very very eagerly agreed to get into the car, get into the warm, um, so that he could drive her, I guess, home. Unfortunately, this is what would make Karen the weepy voiced killer's first victim, and at 3 a.m., 911 received a call from the weepy voiced killer where he basically said he needed an ambulance and a squad car to go to Pierce Butler Road at the Malberg Manufacturing Company because there was a body there or a, a girl there and that he had hurt the girl. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road. Uh, Malmberg Manufacturing Company. Miss Hurry, she's laying on the ground in the back by the by the railroad tracks by the engine. Hurry. Police responded to this call immediately. They went out there, and that is where they found Karen Potak lying right near the railway, on the ground behind the manufacturing company. And this was an area that was completely deserted at night. So it's very likely that if he didn't call it in, nobody would have found her. When she was found, she was naked in a snowbank and had been very brutally beaten with a tire iron. She was beaten so badly that her skull had been cracked open. So luckily she was still alive. She was rushed straight to the hospital, straight into emergency surgery, surgery and she did survive. Unfortunately, because the attack, attack was so brutal, she was suffering from some brain injuries and just remembered absolutely nothing from her attack and absolutely nothing of her attacker. She really couldn't give any information to police. Unfortunately, there was also no physical evidence left at the scene, so there was literally nothing for police to go off and the case eventually just kind of 
came to a dead end. On the 3rd of June in 1981, 18-year-old Kimberly Crompton arrived in St. Paul's. She was originally from a small town called Pepin, Wisconsin. And when I say small town, there was literally like 1,000 people living in this town. Like it was tiny. So after she graduated from high school, she packed all of her stuff and she headed out to St. Paul's. She was so excited to start this new chapter in her life, in the city, to get away from, you know, her small hometown. She caught a Greyhound bus from Pepin to Saint, downtown St. Paul's and when she got there she hired locker number 750 so that she could store her bags in there while she went and got some food and luckily for her directly across from the Greyhound bus depot 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 um there was a Mickey's diner so she was starving at this point went straight across to Mickey's Diner and they had a special on that night which was barbecue beef and fries which is what she ordered and she sat down in a booth alone to eat that and then a few booths down uh, there was there was what there was also a man sitting there alone eating as well and he noticed that she was eating alone and decided to go up to her strike up a conversation which is when she told him that she was new she had just gotten to St. Paul's from her small town and she just didn't know anything about anything about St. Paul's and didn't know what was what and where was where. The man was kind enough to offer to drive Kimberly around and show her the sights around St. Paul and just kind of show her the ropes, give her a little bit of a tour, which made Kimberly extremely excited. She was so happy that she could get like a local to, you know, show her around this new place that she knew nothing about. So once they finished their meals, they of course left together for their tour. Unfortunately, a few hours later, 911 received a call from the weepy voice killer claiming that he had stabbed someone with an ice pick, um, but this time he didn't tell them where to find the victim. You find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Hello? Are you there? Although it wasn't long before they found Kimberly Crompton's body near an unfinished Highway 35B. The area was extremely secluded. I mean, it was an unfinished highway and it had a beautiful view of the Mississippi M Mississippi River. I almost said Minipee because we have a Minipee Park here in Brisbane. Um, but yeah, because of this view, it is assumed that he took her there to, I don't know, show her the view and that's how he kind of lured her out of the car was to look at the view which is when he began to stab her with the ice pick. She was stabbed 61 times with this ice pick and by the time police had arrived on scene she had died due to blood loss. It is so incredibly sad that she had just gotten to this new place with all these big dreams. She was 18, just out of high school, and so excited to, you know, experience life in the city rather than from her small town. Like, and within a few hours of her arriving at this new place, she was killed and so brutally before she even got to experience it. So when police first discovered her body, she had no ID on her, so they couldn't identify her straight away. It wasn't until later where they found her key in her pocket, went down to the Greyhound bus depot and into her locker, which is where they found her ID and were able to positively identify her as Kimberly Crompton. Also during her autopsy, they found some undigested beef and chips in her system, which is kind of how they were able to piece together her last few movements. So obviously they saw that Mickey's diner was right across the road from the bus depot. They saw that they had a special on that night of the barbecue beef and fries. Obviously they straight away went and interviewed the staff at Mickey's and the waitress that was there working was able to tell them kind of a little bit of what happened. They just, you know, she kind of confirmed that she was eating there alone and there was also a man eating there alone and that they left together, but she couldn't identify the man or give any other information. And once again, there was no physical evidence left at the crime scene. So just like with Karen, the case started to go cold. Or I don't even think going cold is the word, but it just stalled and police couldn't go anywhere. But that wasn't for long because literally two days later they got another 911 call from the Weepy Voice Killer. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. 
don't know why I had this tavern. I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll just try not to kill anybody else. In this call, he basically said sorry. He said that he couldn't help himself and that he was going to try not to kill again. And the police decided to release this 911 call to the media in the hopes that somebody would be able to, you know, identify his voice and then call in and say, you know, I know who this man is. And boy, did they. The leads came in so hot. There were so many, like literally hundreds. Police followed up on every single one, but literally nothing came from it. Once again, police were kind of at a halt and the case just started to go cold again. There was nowhere they could go from the position they were in. It wasn't until nine months later that police finally had a breakthrough. So Detective Mills, who I believe is like a retired detective, got a suspect or had a suspect in mind. So what happened or how this came about is that two months after Kimberly Crumpton's death, a man named Alan Lopez murdered his entire family. And then about four hours after he murdered his family, he was kind of in like a standoff police. Like he was just like barricaded in his house. Police were outside not wanting to go in and charge because obviously he had murdered his whole family. So, you know, he could have been dangerous. They don't know what sort of weapons that he had in there. They were just kind of trying to talk him into coming outside. During this standoff while Alan was inside, he yelled out and said or admitted that he was responsible for Kimberly Crompton's death. He was then found guilty of murdering his entire family, but he was deemed mentally incompetent to stand trial. So he was then sent to the state security hospital, which in St. Peter's. Just a few days after arriving at the facility and before police could question him, Alan Lopez committed suicide. So seven months after this is when Detective Mills got his breakthrough. And I hope this isn't too confusing because I know it's a little bit, this part is a little bit all over. I might just recap to get up to the point that we're at now, just so it makes a little bit more sense. So Kimberly Crumpton was murdered. Two months after her murder, Alan Lopez murdered his entire family and admitted to also murdering Kimberly Crompton. He then committed suicide in his mental facility before police questioned him on this. And then seven months from the standoff is when Detective Mills' breakthrough came. So during this investigation, during his breakthrough is when the two cases of Karen Potak and Kimberly Crompton were linked through the phone calls, the 911 phone calls from the weepy voiced killer. So detectives knew that if Alan was responsible for Kimberly Crompton's murder, that he also had to be responsible for Karen Potak's murder. It was then discovered that Lopez couldn't be responsible for Karen Potak's attack because he was in the Anopa State Hospital, which is like a mental facility, the night of her attack. So this just brought the entire theory crashing down until five weeks later when Detective Mills realized or found out that the exact night of Karen Potek's murder, Alan Lopez was out from the facility on a day pass. So this immediately made Mills confident that it had to have been Lopez. Like it was too much of a co like he's already a suspect and then it was just too much of a coincidence that he had a day pass out of the facility the exact night that Karen Potek was attacked. Then later information was brought to light by the media and by the official detective on the case that he couldn't have actually murdered Kimberly Crompton. One call to the Ramsey County Jail confirmed that he was actually in jail the night that Kimberly Crompton was murdered. So from the get-go his confession was false and there's no way that he could have committed the murders. So this ruled him out and literally brought police all the way back to square one. Like literally they had nothing once again. Then on the 6th of August in 1981, 40 year old Barbara Simons was having a night out drinking at the Hexagon Bar in Minneapolis. She was having a good old time. She was dancing the night away, drinking, and she was mostly spending all of the night with this man that she had just met that night. At one point, she actually went up to the bar and ordered a drink and said this really strange comment to the waitress and said, I hope he's nice because he's giving me a ride home. And this comment definitely made the waitress pay very close attention to the man when they were leaving together because she was like, okay, that's kind of a weird comment. And then she just kind of kept an eye on this guy. 
And like luckily she did because later that night another 911 call was made by the weepy voice killer. Please don't talk to this person. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm sick. I'm gonna kill myself, I think. There's so many guys with a little kid on it's me. I killed both people. I'm sorry. I'm never gonna get to help it. And police later found the body of Barbara Simons. It's clear that whoever killed her had tried to dump her body in the Mississippi River in Minneapolis, but her body got caught on the underbrush of the bankment, so they failed and it, it didn't work because her body got caught. She had been stabbed about 100 times and Finding her body along with the call from the killer, it was now clear to police that they were dealing with a serial killer. So police traced her movements back to the Hexagon bar and they interviewed all of the staff there, including the waitress that took, like that she had spoken to, Barbara had spoken to. And she had told them that, you know, Barbara was dancing all night with this unknown man and that they left together. So police then showed her a mug book, which is literally like a, just a book of hundreds of mugshots and she was flipping through them all and it wasn't until the last few mugshots that she actually identified someone and this was the biggest break that police had in this case. At this point police didn't have enough evidence to arrest this guy so they just had to put a surveillance watch team on him like 24-7. But it wasn't long before he committed another crime. On the 20th of August in 1982, he had left his house and the surveillance team was tailing him, but somehow he managed to lose them and it, nobody's sure whether or not he did this on purpose or whether it was kind of just an accident that happened, but he did manage to lose them and then he drove to the red light district in Minneapolis. He pulled up to a 19 year old prostitute named Denise Williams who had been a prostitute since she was 13 years old. They started chatting and they came to an agreement of $100 but he only had $40 on him at the time so he agreed or they agreed that he would give her $40 straight up and then would give her the $60 afterwards. So Denise got into his car, they went back to his apartment in St. Paul's and had sex. And it was all over very quickly. So Denise was worried that he was going to ask for more, which he didn't. He was real quick, like two seconds. So I was like, dang, he's going to want to do something else again. Like he, was, he was like, no, we're, it, it's cool. So then he offered to drive her back to where he picked her up. And they got in the car, started driving, and he started making some really weird turns. He ended up going down some back streets, some very dark streets that had no street lights. And Denise asked him what was going on because she knew all of the back streets. She knew all of the shortcuts. And he said that he was just taking a shortcut, which she knew like wasn't the case. And she started, you know, worrying about what was going to happen next and thinking that she needed some sort of game plan in case he did try something. So she was looking around the car, which is when she found a glass bottle on the floor of the car and she was like okay you know if he tries anything I'm gonna grab that bottle and I'm gonna smash it on his head. She was super unsettled and then eventually he pulled into a dead end parking lot on Coolidge Avenue which was actually like a residential area but it was extremely dark no street lights whatsoever. When the car came to a stop, he said something like, ass, grass, or gas, no one rides for free. And then he stabbed her in the stomach with a screwdriver. So Denise, like she had planned before, grabbed the bottle and just smashed him over the head with it. It broke, of course, and she just kept hitting him. And this really cut him up. It cut like his hand, his cheek, and his head. And he was bleeding, like a lot of blood. But that did not seem to stop him. He just kept trying to stab her while she was doing everything in her power to try and fight him off. She was biting, she was kicking, she was hitting him. Eventually she managed to get the car door open and she fell out and the man fell on top of her and she decided to take a different approach and to play dead. So she said, I'm dying, I'm dying. And then she just laid completely flat, which did nothing because he just kept stabbing her. So then she decided to start screaming, which is when a nearby neighbor named Douglas Panning heard all of the commotion, came out of his house to see what was going on, and saw this man on top of Denise. There was this guy on top of this gal, and he was just whacking away, man, just, just 
big, big swooping booms. Which is when he ran over to try and pull the attacker off her, but this guy got up and started swinging the screwdriver to him. So Douglas ran back into his house, and while he was running, the man started chasing him as well. But he managed to get inside, close the door before the guy could get to him, and he called an ambulance and called the police. And this guy, the attacker, just decided to give up. He obviously knew that the police was going to be there soon and he didn't want to get caught. So he just got straight into his car and literally floored it. The man went back over to help Denise and to stay with her until the ambulance and the police got there. And Denise had been stabbed 15 times in her head, in her abdomen and in her chest and her liver and her lung had actually been punctured. She was of course rushed to the hospital and rushed straight into emergency surgery and luckily she did survive. Denise actually had a warrant out for her arrest at the time for violating probation so she gave them a fake name, she said her name was Mary and said that she met this guy because she was hitchhiking and he picked her up. Um, but eventually she decided to come clean and tell the truth. That same night, actually, police received another 911 call from the Weepy Voice Killer. But this time it was very different than his usual calls. I need an ambulance. I'm all cut up. I got beat up. What's your apartment number? 208. I'm bleeding. 208. Where are you bleeding from? From my arm, my face, my head. He called up saying that he was injured and that he needed a paramedic and he gave them the number for them to come and pick him up. But the people on the other line, they just knew who he was from the voice and so they not only sent an ambulance but they sent police. When they got to the address, they arrested 37 year old Paul Stefani. He was the same man the waitress at the Hexagon had picked out from the mug book and he was also the same man that the police had under surveillance. Denise had also picked him out of the mug book that night and he was charged with attempted murder. Paul Stefani was born on the 8th of September in 1944 in Austin, Minnesota. He was one of 10 children and grew up in a very religious household. He moved to St. Paul in the 60s where he had had multiple jobs, which he had been fired from a lot of them as well, and he was currently working as a janitor. He kept losing jobs and blamed the epilepsy that he had suffered on his job at the Malberg Manufacturing Company. If you guys remember that from when Karen Protek was attacked. So obviously he worked there, he knew the area very well, and that must have been why he took her there because he knew that it was going to be very isolated for him to attack her. Stefani had a previous history with mental health both in his family and in himself specifically and he had also previously been convicted with aggravated assault which is why his mugshot was in the mug, mug book. So after they arrested him, police obviously took him in for questioning and they asked him about the attack of Karen Potak, they asked him about the murder of Kimberly Crompton, and they asked him about the murder of Barbara Simons. They also got out all of the crime scene photos, as well as the case file from the Weeple Voice Killer, and he immediately saw this and said, you're not going to pin those on me, and then denied any involvement with any of these crimes. Anyway, he was of course charged with the murder of Barbara Simons and the attempted murder of Denise Williams, which are the two that occurred in Minneapolis. The murder of Kimberly Crumpton and attack of Karen Potak happened in St. Paul, so the Minneapolis police weren't able to, it wasn't in their jurisdiction, so if they were going to, if anyone was gonna take, charge him with those two crimes, it would have to be the St. Paul's police because it was their jurisdiction. So anyway, his six week trial began in February of 1985 for the two Minneapolis crimes and he pled not guilty to both. The prosecution relied very heavily on matching the 911 calls to Stefani's voice. So they had a voice expert come in to compare the two voices and while the voice expert said they are remarkably similar, he cannot conclusively say that they were an exact match. So this is when they brought Stefani's family members up to the stand and they brought his mum and his sister and they both agreed that it was Stefani's voice. Without a doubt, Stefani's sister listened to the 911 calls and then she just bowed her head and said, yeah, that was definitely my brother. At the end of the six-week trial, Stefani was found guilty of both 
crimes and he was sentenced to 40 years for the murder of Barbara Simons and 18 years for the attempted murder of Denise Williams. And you would think that considering the results of this trial that the St. Paul's police would also try to get justice for Kimberly Crompton and Karen Potak um, but they decided against it. They said that they didn't have enough evidence to tie him to the crimes and also considered that, you know, he was already going to be serving time in jail. So what was the point in trying him? Which I guess I understand, but it would leave Karen Protek and the family of Kimberly Crompton without any closure, which is very unfortunate. This was until 1997, so 12 years later, Paul Stefani was diagnosed with terminal skin cancer and he reached out to the St. Paul's police. I guess maybe at this point he decided that he had wanted to clear his conscience. So St. Paul's police went to meet him and set up an interview which is where he admitted to the murder of Kimberly Crompton and the attack on Karen Potak but he wasn't done there. He actually confessed to another murder, one that he was not even even like a blip on the radar for. This murder did not at all fit his MO, so police were extremely shocked when he admitted to the murder of 33-year-old Kathleen Greening. This murder took place just a few weeks before the murder of Barbara Simons on the 31st of July in 1982, and he had drowned her in the bathtub of her home. You say that you both got into the tub? Yes. And you sh you're positive about that? Yes. Because, I mean, when I, I remember when I pushed her head underwater, I could see her face. Did you push her in by her, push her head down, or did you push her in the chest area to, under the water? I held her shoulders down. You held her shoulders down? Yeah, got, uh, Both hands then? Yeah. So police obviously got out the case, cold case files on this and looked through all the evidence, which is when they found a phone book of hers, which had been taken in for evidence. They looked through it and they found a, they found the name Paul S with a number next to it. And when they looked up Paul Stefani's number from when he was arrested for the attack on Denise Williams, his number matched the one in the phone book. To this day, nobody knows what their relationship was and nobody has any idea why he murdered her. Um, but yeah, it was definitely outside of his MO, quite a shock, especially considering there was no 911 call for this. The prosecutor that secured the conviction of, for the murder of Barbara Simons doesn't believe at all that he enjoyed doing this. He doesn't think that he relished in the murder. He thinks that he felt extremely guilty for what he had done and that's why he made the 911 calls. He said that he thinks that he just couldn't stop himself and that that's why when he was caught, he couldn't even admit what he was done, had done. In Stefani's own words, he said that killing seemed like something that you were supposed to do. That's something that was just a part of life, like driving a car. So that does bring us to the end of this case. I would absolutely Absolutely love to know you guys thoughts on this if you think that he did have any remorse or if you think that he was just putting on an act let me know in the comments down below and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video bye